Good morning, my name is Leith Calif, Financial Analyst at AJ Bell. Thank you very much for uh, joining me for this morning's webinar. So today I'm going to be looking at um, the reopening trade, the recovery trade, um, the reflation trade, whatever you want to call it. Um, basically what's happened in markets um, since um, uh, the announcement of the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine last November, which was a bit of a, a watershed moment for markets, looking at how they performed since then. But also asking the question, has that reflation trade now run out of steam? So I'm um, just going to start uh, with a little bit of scene setting quickly, just to take a look at how markets um, have performed since that crucial announcement um, in November. Now, we've heard a lot, obviously, about there being this big, you know, uptake and uh, upswing in, in cyclical stocks, big value rally, and that certainly has happened. So probably one of the key uh, metrics that you look at in terms of um, cyclical indices is the FTSE 100. Lots of banks, lots of oil majors, lots of resource stocks in there. And you can see from this chart here, um, uh, what we've got is, um, you know, a, a very sharp um, a recovery in November, a lot of that recovery actually taking place during lockdown before any kind of restrictions uh, were eased. Uh, obviously, kind of the market looking forward um, and, and uh, uh, looking forward to restrictions being eased and actually moving in that time. Um, things have kind of gone sideways for a little while now because, again, the market's looking forward and um you know it hasn't got this kind of big um looming end to all restrictions instead it's worried about other things um notably kind of the pandemic variants but also inflation which we'll come on to in a bit so you know looking at this chart i mean that kind of emphasizes how good uh, a period it's been on the market obviously a big bounce back um from um from pandemic lows and a lot of that has been driven um by by cyclical stocks but what's actually quite interesting is if we have a look also at um the us market and this is the nasdaq so this is a very tech heavy index about 50 percent of this index is invested in, in technology stocks so you know from this chart you can see that over the last uh, nine months ago or so since since the pfizer announcement um, yes, the FTSE 100, that kind of indicator of cyclical uh, stocks has, has done well, but actually so has the NASDAQ and actually kind of to date then they're, they're neck and neck. Um, so um, the technology sector uh, and the growth sector hasn't been written off entirely. It's done very well as well. Thank you very much. And actually, if you zoom out a little bit and look towards the, the start of, of the pandemic, you can you can see from this slide that, that yes, there has been a bounce back in the FTSE 100, uh, but it's still not back to where it was um, pre pre pandemic. Um, and also, um, if you compare that to the Nasdaq, it's still way behind. Um, so, yes, it's been a better sort of nine months or so for for cyclical stocks in that they've kept pace with with those technology stocks. Um, but we we haven't seen certainly a long term. Um, kind of um, um, period of, of outperformance from, from, from value in cyclical sectors. And I mean, you can also see this, this is just an example of some stocks within, within each of these indices. So, you know, some, some key beneficiaries of, of reopening you would expect. You can see that, you know, the, 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 these UK stocks have done very well um, in terms of their performance since November 2020, but actually still significantly behind where they started the pandemic. Now you compare that to, to the FANGs, actually again, some pretty good performance numbers since November, not, not, not generally quite as strong as the, um, as, the, uh, as, the, as the cyclical UK stocks. But again, look at, the, look at those numbers from the start of the pandemic. So, you know, kind of some, some of these, you know, big companies, these are some of the biggest companies in the world doubling in value. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic. So, you know, although the UK has started doing better, you know, let's not, um, you know, let's keep this in perspective. It's still um, still trading behind um, the, the US uh, stock market and the big uh, tech names over any reasonable time frame. Um, you can also see this in, in kind of where UK investors are putting their money. So this chart shows you the flows uh, into and out of um, various equity regions within the investment association sector. So these are open-ended funds. Um, and what you can see here is that, you know, global funds um, continue to be um, very popular, large inflows into those since, this is uh, data since uh, since November, so since the Pfizer announcement. And the UK continues to be a bet noir for investors. So um, the UK has been out of favour really since um, the Brexit vote. There have been large annual withdrawals from the UK sector and actually 
the vaccine announcement, the strong rollout of the vaccines in this country, and also the strong performance of the, in, uh, the um, stock market in, the, in this country hasn't actually reversed that. And, and just one sort of final way of looking at this, um, these are some of the most popular funds um, um, invested in by DIY investors, but also by advisors um, through the AJ Bell platforms over the last six months. Not a huge amount to hang your hat on here if you think there's been this big sea change um, in investing styles and that and the, um, uh, value is back in at the expense of growth. So I've kind of highlighted two, two, two funds here, which kind of sit in the value camp. Jupiter UK special situations definitely does. I've given Vanguard um, um, uh, uh, FTSE or the UK all share index the benefit of the doubt there just because it's a UK index so you could claim that it is a it is a cyclical bet to some extent. But you look at the rest of the funds here, we're looking at lots of global growth funds, lots of Bailey Gifford, which is a growth house, of course. There is a linear train UK fund in there, but that is a growth fund um, rather than the value fund. So looking at very high quality companies. So you can see that there hasn't really been a big shift in terms of where the money's going in the, in the, in the UK. Um, and then actually, you know, growth, growth stocks and, and global stocks is, are still uh, are still dominating. So let's have a think about, you know, that's where we've been. What about going forward? Is that reflation trade? Um, now, Dad, we've seen obviously the stock market, the FTSE 100 trading sideways uh, for a little while now. I mean, I think there are broadly speaking three areas which are going to determine how the, um, the kind of reflation trade goes from here. One is the pandemic. Not going to spend too much time on that. You won't be surprised to learn, but suffice to say, things are looking um, pretty good in terms of vaccines and case numbers now. But um, you know, it's naive to think that the pandemic will not throw us another um, curveball at some at some point. It's shown itself um, perfectly able to do that. So that risk is still there. It's kind of under unquantifiable. But you know, let's park that for a moment and look at kind of the financial. Uh, matters. So economic performance is obviously going to, to matter hugely to whether the recovery kicks on from here. Um, uh, and, and also um, fiscal and monetary policy, how those um, are extended or withdrawn, if that, whether stimulus is extended or withdrawn is going to have a huge impact um, on, on markets. Um, and obviously inflation is a big part of that, so we'll be looking at that too. So let's um, just start off the bat looking at um, the economy and the, and the prospects for that, particularly here in the UK. So, I mean, this chart shows you how 2020 was pretty bad in the UK. So, um, you know, a 10% fall in, in GDP. Um, so um, I think we're, we're, we're now kind of in a state, obviously, where we are reopening again. We have reopened. Um, but it's important to, to remember that when we get GDP figures, quarterly GDP figures, they are quarter on quarter. So I, I suspect we are going to get some very good GDP figures when they come out uh, next. The next quarterly GDP figures are out in September, and that will look at Q2 um, of, uh, of, of this year. So that is comparing Q2 of this year with Q1 one of this year. Um, so really, uh, you know, an economy that's opening up compared to a closed economy. So you can expect um, some some pretty good growth figures there. Um, I think it's probably fair to point out that things get a bit more difficult um, from then then on. It becomes more difficult to generate growth when you're comparing, you know, the economy a period when the economy is open with another period when the economy is open. It's it's a little bit like you know if you if you owned a corner shop and you were shut for three months and then the next three months you were open well it's very easy to generate growth because you just open the doors people come in and buy stuff um, if you want to generate growth from then on um, then you need more people to come into the shop or you need them to pay more for the items that they're buying or buy more items it's more difficult to generate growth so we should be kind of expecting some strong GDP. Uh, figures, I think, um, coming out for Q2 of this year and, and probably Q3, but also let's not get carried away with what that means in terms of the economy going forward. And I think it's worth just reflecting on, on where we are in terms of, uh, of GDP. This is as of the last um, set of um, uh, ONS figures, which were out for the first quarter of this year. So, you know, what the ship chart shows, shows you is a you know, huge dive uh, in 2020, a, a big rebound as well. And that's what I mean by saying you get very high growth figures when you're bouncing back from virtually nothing. 
Um, so you can see it has been a V-shaped recovery, but only partial. Um, so we've stopped kind of halfway up, 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 up the V, unfortunately. So, you know, the, the latest preliminary figures that we've got from the ONS show that April and May were quite strong. Um, so taking those figures into, to, um, into account, what we're looking at now is the UK economy being somewhere around 3% below its pre-pandemic level. So it's recovered a fair amount of ground there, but there's still, there's still some, um, some, some room for manoeuvre there. Um, now, um, you know, as I say, kind of obviously the quarterly figures will, will be, be what they are. Going forward, when do we get back to that pre-pandemic level, uh, assuming, you know, that, that, that the pandemic does recede as expected? Well, the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, thinks we'll be there by the middle of next year. So that does, I guess, give us a little bit of an indication that we are going to get back there, but it's perhaps going to take a bit longer than maybe a lot of us uh, expected. And that those those final kind of few yards uh, to get back are going to be difficult to achieve, as I say, because because of the fact that you're combat, trying to compound on a, on, a, on a, uh, a period when you've already got strong levels of economic activity is much more difficult than compounding on, their, uh, on a period when you haven't got any um, um, high levels of act economic activity, a lot of the economy is, is mothballed. So let's just keep that in mind. So the other um, 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 you know, kind of part of, of, of this whole kind of uh, equation is, is what happens to monetary policy. Does it continue to be loose? Um, um, you know, it, or, or does it actually start to, to kind of wind back things back in and perhaps perhaps have a, an effect on the economy that way? Um, now, what you can see here, obviously kind of base rates at 0.1%, almost 900 billion pounds worth of QE still sloshing around the system. Um, so monetary policy is still very loose. I actually think it's going to stay loose for a considerable period of time, um, even in the face of inflation. Inflation at the moment is 2.5%, um, so it is currently above the Bank of England target. Um, and it's got there very sharply. Beginning of this year is 0.7%. Um, so you know, there's been a very sharp increase in inflation, and um, it's currently above target and, and looks like it's heading northwards. So the big question is, why isn't the Bank of England doing anything to, to kind of raise rates and rein inflation in? And the answer to that is that the Bank of England thinks that inflation is transitory, and that what we are seeing is kind of a, a one-off effect, and it's gradually going to fade away in time. And that's why um, they're not doing anything and why they probably will continue not to do anything in terms of monetary policy, in terms of moving it where it is, particularly seeing as it brings with it the possibility of damaging the economy. So um, I think it's probably worth taking a look at the inflation um, uh, question um, and you know how that, that plays into what the central bank is doing, because that has a key um, um, uh, kind of that's a key factor in, in how the economy performs and also how it might affect investor portfolios. So, um, I mean, in terms of the, um, you know, the kind of headline inflation rate, it's a really unpredictable macroeconomic uh, phenomenon. So um, here are all the things that could potentially affect inflation. If you look at any one of these var invariables in and of itself, it's very unpredictable. So if you kind of mash them all together, then you've got unpredictable to the, to the power of unpredictable. So I think it's fair to acknowledge that there is, you know, kind of a high degree of uncertainty um, about where we go from here, particularly given the circumstances uh, that we find ourselves in sort of a very, very strange um, situation where we're, we have had a voluntarily locked down economy where there has been, you know, very little um, activity. So, um, I suspect that you've you've probably heard um, a lot um, about inflationary risks in the economy, um, and um, I think that those are very real, um, and that we shouldn't certainly downplay those. But what I wanted to do today was just take a look at some of the counter arguments because I think perhaps they haven't got as much airtime. Um, just to kind of have a look at the, just to kind of have a kind of a bit of a balanced view. Um, so. There are there are three three that I'm going to look at. One is one is base effects. One is bank lending, um, and we're also going to look have a look at, at fiscal policy as well to see how these things might actually put a break on inflation. Now, again, I would stress I'm not saying that this is definitely going to happen, uh, but it's just worth considering uh, the other side of the coin here. 
so just looking at, at base effects so um just to explain what i mean by that um inflation is is actually um you know headline inflation is 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 a number which is just an annual figure so it's um looking at um, prices now versus prices a year ago um and so um it's not just a measure of what's going on right now it's also a measure of what's going on a year ago and how those two things relate and so what we mean by base effects is really what is going on at the base of the calculation i.e the, the the month that we're looking at last year um, and clearly the latest inflation data that, that, that we have now that's coming out around the kind of spring or summer time um, if you look back to where we were last year there were huge distortions in the market because um, the pandemic had just hit so this is kind of an illustration of where we were with the oil price um, so you know it fell down to, 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 to 20 20 bucks or also a barrel um, you know some contracts were actually trading at negative prices if you can get your head around that um, and we've seen a big a big rebound since then um, so oil price now trading at 70 70 bucks a barrel so you can think about like just looking back to like last year compared to prices today what that's done for inflation well obviously that's going to push inflation up but actually if you look back say two years if you're comparing inflation to two years ago, so prices now to sorry prices now to prices two years ago, you say that there's very little inflationary pressure from the oil price. It's just been this big dip in the middle. And as I was saying, it now that we've kind of bounced back and opened up, it does get more difficult to make economic progress from here, and that obviously has an impact on 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 the oil price. So, you know, when people aren't driving around traveling around then obviously the oil price falls when they start traveling around the oil price rises but then how does the oil price then to kick on for, from here something else needs to happen and in order for inflationary pressures within from the oil price to keep building um, then we would need a similarly dramatic increase in the oil price from this year to next as we saw from this year to last and obviously that's going to be a much more challenging proposition so i think the same thing can actually be observed in um, um in in wages as well um so um if you um have a look at um wage growth um then what you can see from here is that um you know we've got a similar situation where whereby um at the moment wage growth is um you know somewhere around 6.6 percent .6%, i think was the last last reading from from the ons for may if you look back to what was happening last year then growth uh, then then uh, pay growth was virtually um a zero and actually going negative and the reason for that um was that um there are some very distortive effects from uh, the government response to, to the pandemic one is furlough um this time last year so in may last year over eight million people were uh, on furlough uh, and this year in may at the end of may it was just over two so last year you had a significantly larger number of people who were um you know receiving 80 percent of their pay compared to now so obviously that's going to have an effect on earnings um there's also been a compositional effect in um uh in in pay growth um, and what I mean by that is that if you look at, um, you know, the, the people who have dropped out of the calculation of wage growth, i.e. those jobs that have been lost during the pandemic, a lot of them are from the hospitality sector, um, which tends to be, to be lower paid. And so those coming out of the equation has also helped to elevate wage, uh, average, uh, the growth in av average wages. A way to think about it is if you've got, say, 10 people in a room, and the shortest person leaves so if that happens then the average height of the room has gone up but nobody's actually got any taller um so that's also probably how the bank of england is looking at this is looking back and saying well we've got these kind of distorted effects and actually things are going to calm down um once everything kind of gets back onto onto a level keel and we're, we're comparing like for like now the ons have done some experimental figures that basically look at um uh, wage growth and they're stripping out furlough, stripping out uh, that compositional effect and they reckon wage growth on that basis is currently running at 3.2 to 4.4 percent uh, which is kind of roughly where it was pre-pandemic and in line with its long-run average so if that continues to be the case again that is a signal that an inflationary cycle isn't taking off yet so uh, 
thought it's also worth um, looking at um, uh, looking at um, bank lending. So um, this is um, uh, figures for um, repos uh, uh, held with the, the US Federal Reserve overnight. So um, um, basically what, what, what this is, is money that's basically being held on short-term deposit with the US Federal Reserve um, by um, US commercial banks. So uh, you can see that there's been a big tick up recently, there's around $900 billion you know, fantastical amount of money that's just being held overnight by um, commercial banks in the US. And what that suggests is that central bank, uh, sorry, it's commercial banks have um, a great deal of liquidity. They have money there. What they're not doing at the moment is lending that out into the economy. Um, so, um, you know, it's not going out to consumers and businesses. It's just being parked overnight at, at the US Fed. Um, so, that being the case, that suggests that, um, you know, that the, again, that there isn't kind of like, you know, kind of money just being pumped out into the economy and the banks are actually kind of helping to spread that around. They're not doing that at the moment. And we've seen the same in terms of bank lending here in, in, in the UK, looking at results from the banks over the last week. The, the broad picture is that there has been a slight pickup in, in lending, but a lot of that is mortgage lending. Um, you know, so it's just going into the housing market into boosting kind of house prices. It's not um, at the moment finding its way into, into the pockets of businesses and consumers. Now, I would point out that, you know, there is definitely an argument here that this amount of liquidity does mean that, you know, banks can turn the taps on at any particular point and that could be inflationary. And again, I would I would say that that definitely is a risk. Um, so perhaps at the moment, because the economy is not firing on all cylinders, there isn't a huge amount of demand from, from businesses to go out and borrow money to do stuff. And maybe that will come in the coming months. So, you know, this is a, you know, we're early days yet at the moment. This isn't pointed towards an inflationary cycle, but equally this amount of liquidity in the system could, if banks turn on the lending taps, suddenly uh, lead to a flood of money hitting the economy. So let's also just be aware of that. Um, also just um, um, worth um, looking, I think, at, um, at uh, what, what kind of fiscal policy is doing, what, what, what taxes are going to do, because that, again, will have an impact on inflation. Um, now, this is kind of a chart showing you how the kind of budget uh, from this year, the, how the, the, um, how the um, kind of decisions play out in terms of um, treasury um, treasury finances. So what you can see is kind of in the short term, the treasury is giving out money. So this 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 tax here, for instance, what we've got is um, you know 24 billion pounds of, of, of stimulus going into the economy in the form of furlough, um, business rates relief. Um, you know we've got the kind of um, super deduction coming up as well. So in the short term. We've got money being ploughed into the economy from the Treasury. But look what happened from 2023 onwards. Treasury starts raking that money back in. Um, and that is mainly through two policy measures. Uh, one is the freezing of tax thresholds, which will obviously impact consumers. And the other is um, uh, increase in uh, corporation tax. And what the Treasury will be doing is taking money from consumers and businesses and paying down debt. And that actually is disinflationary. So in the longer term, basically taking money out of the economy and using it to pay down debt that's already been accumulated. So that should act as a break on price rises because you know, consumers and businesses don't have as much money anymore to go out and chase goods and, and drive prices up. And just while we're on the, the, the subject of taxation, um, I think um, it's also um, fair to um, just take a look at what else might be coming down the road. So, um, so far, um, the government hasn't give, given any kind of um, departmental spending um, uh, figures for um, after this year for kind of stuff related to containing and, um, you know, kind of maintaining our way of life in the face of coronavirus. Um, and this is what um, the OBR reckons might be coming down the road. So. Um, uh, a health bill of seven billion pounds per annum, uh, education 1.25 billion, transport two billion, so around 10 billion 
um, uh, pounds worth of extra spending that the government is going to have to fund somehow. And you'd expect um, a large portion of that to come, to come through extra tax rises. We've also recently had um, a, um, uh, a lot of kind of speculation, um, a lot of it probably driven by, by um, uh, the government briefing journalists that they are going to increase national insurance to pay for social care, and that's an extra 10 billion. So just be aware that the kind of tax rises that we saw in the budget uh, might not be a one and done. We might have um, some more heading down the, uh, the road towards this as well. So uh, where does that all leave us on, on the inflation question? Well, this is the Bank of England fan chart. Um, always ends up at around 2%. Um, and and um, last time out, no, uh, exactly the same. I mean, to be fair to them, if it wasn't 2%, they'd adjust policy uh, until it was 2%. So what this chart is showing is that in the central case, the Bank of England thinks that um, inflation in the medium term will be 2%. What's probably interesting to think about in this chart is that the line that you see on the left hand side is what's happened, that's, that's inflation. The kind of fan chart that you see on the right is what might happen. And um, the Bank of England assigns a 30% um, uh, possibility to each of the shaded bands actually occurring. Um, and actually a 10% uh, possibility to something happening outside of those uh, uh, shaded bands. So that, you know, as you'd expect from the Bank of England, it adds up to 100%. Uh, so uh, what, you, what you can see here is, yes, there is, you know, kind of uh, an expectation that inflation will run at 2% in the medium term, but actually there is a high degree of uh, uncertainty and inflation could well run hotter and, and colder. So, Hopefully, we've just kind of talked around a few, few of the issues um, in terms of inflation. Talked about, um, you know, some of the some of the reasons why inflation might be a, a dog that doesn't bark. Again, I would say that's that's not kind of a, a projection. As I said at the beginning, this stuff is just really difficult to actually predict, um, and um, you know, we have to we have to be kind of a cognizant of that. But just to kind of acknowledge that there are kind of risks in, in, in both, both directions. I think from the Bank of England's point of view, the clincher for me in terms of why I think that they are going to keep monetary policy loose, um, even in the face of rising inflation, is if you think about their toolkit, um, you know, what problems are they quite well equipped to deal with? Well, what happens um, if we get higher inflation? Well, the Bank of England needs to increase uh, interest rates. Well, it's got plenty of scope to do that because interest rates are so low. Now, I'm not saying that wouldn't be painful uh, for, for businesses and households, but it does have plenty of room for manoeuvre in terms of tightening monetary policy. What about another problem? What about an economic uh, downturn? Well, actually, the Bank of England doesn't have much room for manoeuvre. Um, in terms of an economic downturn, because interest rates are already so low, because there's so much QE already in the system, it's getting to the point where its actions are just not, not really having the same effect. And so it would much rather err on the side of inflation coming around because actually it can kind of swap that fly, whereas actually another economic downturn it hasn't got that much firepower left because of how loose monetary policy already is. Now, while that's true of the central bank, I'm not entirely sure that's true of investor portfolios. Um, I suspect that a lot of investor portfolios um, might well be skewed towards assets that have done well over the last 10 years because those assets have swelled in portfolios and also more money has been allocated to them because they're successful. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm probably thinking here about stuff like bonds, long dated bonds, um, um, you know, um, bond proxies. Uh, and also kind of growth your areas of the market like, like the tech sector. Um, and all of those things might struggle in a kind of inflationary environment. Um, and what I've, what I've put here is actually these are, this is the kind of first half performance of the investment association sectors. So open-ended fund sectors, this is the bottom end of the table. And you can see it's, 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 all, it's all bond funds. Um, now since ETFs joined the IA sectors, they're actually more more bond, bond sectors than you care to shake a stick at. But what, what you can see here is that the first half has not been good for bonds. I'll probably ask you to, to just look at UK gilts, which is probably the, the kind of most important there, minus 6% over the first half of this year. Not a huge loss, 
um, particularly by kind of you know, stock market standards. But if you think about why people are invested in guilds, they tend to begin there because they they view them as safe and they don't want to see uh, any losses from their portfolio. Um, so you know, a six percent loss, while not the end of the world, is not not insignificant. Um, I think it's also just worth taking a look at longer term kind of guilt yields and, and, and where we are. Now you can see kind of over the last 25 years, yields have just um, um, drifted lower and lower, prices obviously going in the op opposite direction. Um, now, um, you know, kind of, I, I think the 10-year the, the guilt now trading at 0.6% tells you that um, the, the bond market is not pricing in very high levels of inflation at the moment, because if it was, um, you'd be getting a much higher yield. Um, from, uh, uh, from 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 bonds, and you can see kind of like over the first half that six percent fall that we just saw in in UK guilt funds. You can see what a small kind of backup in yields that was. So if we do get inflation, um, then you would expect this to rise. And I, I kind of leave it to your imagination what would happen to bond funds. Um, you know, if 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 we got to a situation where you know inflation was running at four or five percent and bond yields were backing up to kind of three four percent, which they were um, prior to the financial crisis. Um, so you know, given given the inflationary risks, um, given the fact that there there are also some factors you know fighting in the opposite direction, uh, and the fact that we obviously live in a very kind of strange and and kind of peculiar economic situation where we're reopening an economy that we ourselves have closed down. It's just worth kind of hammering home the re that that kind of it's it's about kind of portfolios having balance, not pointing in one direction rather than the other. And I suspect that actually portfolios are probably at the moment pointing towards low inflation more than they are pointing towards um, uh, you know higher inflation. And certainly, if you look at some of the fund buying statistics that we were looking at earlier, um, you know that kind of those kind of cyclical value plays and not and not really. Um, uh, not really on the agenda, even though we've seen um, a big step up in prices. So um, that's that's probably all I've got to say for today on that, the reflation trade, inflation and the economy. Um, I thought it might be just interesting to finish off just looking at a few things that have been happening of late that are of interest, that I, I think, in, in the fund space. Um, and just to kick off, I just wanted to, to take a look at um, Vanguard Life Strategy Funds. Um, because I, I think this is actually an interesting microcosm of what's been going on in, in, in the bond market as well. Um, now, the funds recently went through their 10-year um, anniversary here in the UK. Um, and if you look first at, at the 10-year figures, look at, let's look at the mixed asset funds to begin with. We'll come to the 100% equity in, in a moment. But if you look at the fixed, uh, fixed um, equity funds, over 10 years, they've absolutely wiped the floor um, with um, uh, other funds in their sectors. And in fact, in that top one, life strategy, 20% equity, it's the top performing fund in its sector over 10 years, which is not something that you expect from a passive vehicle. Um, and what um, what is going on here is actually quite interesting, is that obviously life strategy funds, they just do what they say on the tin. Um, so they invest a certain amount in bonds and a certain amount in equities, and they keep that, that amount in bonds um, levels. So, you know, the 40% equity fund will have 60% in bonds and a lot of that in long dated bonds. Now, if you think about what other managers, active managers in those sectors have been doing, you know, you know, for probably most of the last 10 years is that they have been wary of quantitative easing, creating this bubble in bond prices and have so dialed back their bond exposure, taking perhaps uh, shorter duration bets, looking at, uh, at bonds with, with shorter maturities rather than longer, longer duration, and maybe moving into cash, and also things like gold, um, just looking for other places to put money you know, to, to, avoid, to avoid kind of a crash in the bond market. Now, that hasn't happened. Actually, being long duration has been the right call um, for, for you know, the, the last 10 years since quantitative easing began in 2009. Um, what's also interesting here is if you look over the last year, because of you know, the chart that we were just looking at in terms of bond funds losing money over the last um, six months or so while equity markets have, have soared, actually there's been a reversal in fortunes. And the life, mixed asset life strategy funds have fallen down the sector rankings. Now, if we do get 
um, uh, uh, kind of uh, a period of inflation where bonds actually do finally sell off. I'm not saying we're definitely going to get that. But if that happens, then that could be a blueprint for for, for future performance. Um, now, obviously, the life strategy funds are you know kind of mechanical. They do what they say in the tin. That is part of their appeal. Is the simplicity so they're not suddenly going to say well actually we think that there might be a bit of a bond bubble here maybe we'll dial, dial down our bond exposure that's just not going to happen and that is you know part of the secret source that has led to their success over the last 10 years so that really puts the emphasis back onto fund buyers to say well you know um how much should we be be, be allocating to, to this area um, interestingly, if you look at the 100% uh, equity fund, which doesn't have any bond exposure, it's much more in the middle of the pack in the sectors, which is, of course, what you would expect um, from, from a passive fund. So it's it, the life strategy is a little bit, it's got more UK equity and less US equity than the MSCI World Index. So, you know, it's, it's behind that, that index, not that that's the one that attracts. Um, but you know, it's 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 a good global tracker fund. It's not the cheapest on the market, but it does what it said on says on the tin, and that's what obviously investors want from passive vehicles. There's also been some interesting stuff happening in the investment trust space. Um, this is a, a note from the uh, Association of um, uh, Investment Companies. So it was a record-breaking year in terms of fundraising uh, uh, for investment trusts. Sorry, the first half of this year. Um, a lot of that was secondary fundraising, so existing trusts raising money from investors, but actually a large proportion of it, 1.2 billion pounds, was raised in investment trust IPOs. And that's interesting because at the same time this happens. Um, a Lion Trust um, launched an ESG investment trust and failed to get it off the ground because they didn't get enough money. So this is, you know, Lion Trust, you know, well-trusted brand. Uh, with uh, an ESG offering from their sustainable futures team who've been around since the turn of the century, really well regarded. And it's it's launching in the ESG space, which we all know is really hot right now. So, you know, why did that happen? And um, particularly against the backdrop of, you know, record amounts of fundraising in the investment trust sector. And this is this is actually the note that Lion Trust issued um, to, to say that they were no longer proceeding with the trust. And in red, I've kind of highlighted um, uh, some some sentiments from John Irons, the chief executive of Lion Trust, which I think really kind of sum up what happened here. So we received significant significant commitment from investors for ESGT post-launch, but not enough for the IPO. So investors were willing to buy it after it launched on the market, but not during the IPO period. So what, why was that? Well, I think there are probably two reasons. One is that there are setup costs involved with um, investment trusts if you buy at launch. So uh, normally around around 2%. Um, so you can expect to soak those up as a, as a new investor, um, which, you know, if, if, if you then buy on the market, you, you wouldn't expect that. But probably I think the, the kind of more telling difference is the question of um, premiums or discounts. Once a trust is on the market, obviously it can trade at the premium or a discount. Whereas if you buy at the IPO during the launch period, you get in at the net asset value of the trust. So if we just look again at what the Association of Investment uh, uh, Companies uh, showed us, which was that there has been, you know, this 1.2 billion pounds worth of IPOs. Just look at the sectors that these IPOs are in, mainly in infrastructure. Okay, so fairly niche, but also hold that thought mainly in infrastructure. Then just take a look at the discounts and premiums that are available on infrastructure trusts. So you can see that all infrastructure trusts in the AIC sectors are trading on a premium. So as an investor going in during the launch period, I can get in at, at uh, net asset value. I will have to pay some setup costs, but actually the alternative is that I can invest in one of these trusts and I would have to pay a significant premium to do that. So hence, it's probably a good idea for me to buy in at launch. Now, take a look at the global equity sector, which was where the Lion Trust, um, ESG Trust was um, was launching. Now you can see lots of trusts here um, trading at a discount. And I've also um, uh, highlighted their Keystone Positive Change because that is a global equity trust which has an ESG mandate. So similar to the Lion Trust Trust, it's run by Bailey Gifford, again, a respected fund house. So as a fund buyer, uh, as a trust buyer rather, again, you have this, this question of should I buy an IPO? Well, 
Um, I could do, but I pay the set of costs. And actually, there are lots of trusts trading in the sector which are at a discount. So if I wait until it launches on the market, I probably will be able to pick out a discount. Or if not, I can just involve, invest in an alternative trust and, and pick up a bargain. So that is a bit of an issue. Uh, with um, you know, investment trust structurally for those that are trying to launch into areas where there are lots of discounts on the market um, because that same psychology will probably prevail and actually looking back to last year if you think about um, Telworth and Buffetology both trying to launch investment trusts and failing um, then um, there was probably a, a, a large proportion of that was also driven by the fact that also in, the, in those sectors discounts were available on existing trusts so why buy in at launch um there's also some stuff rumbling on at the moment which i think it's worth being aware of on property funds so the fca is considering introducing 90 to 100 day 180 day notice periods for property funds um it's currently consulting on that that's now being tied up with a consultation on what's called a long-term asset fund uh, which the chancellor is very keen on he said that he wants one of these things up and running by november what it will be is a vehicle uh, for um, investors to invest in illiquid assets. Um, so um, real estate would be one of them, but also infrastructure and uh, and uh, private equity. So this is an open-ended vehicle rather than closed-ended and would consequently have notice periods. So it sounds like we might be getting notice periods on, on property funds. Um, now, the FCA have said that they're going to give a long up to two years notice period uh, before bringing this in so there's time for the market to to adjust um, but um, you know we've done some research uh, uh, with with our customers and a, a large number half, more than half of them said that they'd actually sell their holdings if a three to six month um, notice period was, was was brought in those are retail investors I suspect you know advisors uh, and wealth managers are also probably in a similar boat because you know rebalancing a portfolio that has property in it because that will be more, much more difficult if you have to give you know three to six months notice on a bit of the portfolio rather than the rest it all just becomes a little bit messy and so you know the, the kind of doomsday scenario is that the FCA introduces these rules and th there's a flight of capital from the property sector suspensions come in again um, and actually lots of property funds close down um, we have seen some evidence of that already. Aviva and Keynes have actually recently closed down their property funds because they don't have enough assets anymore because there's already quite a lot of sentiment against the sector uh, for obvious reasons. So just bear in mind that that's kind of rumbling on and one worth worth watching. I suspect we'll probably get some output from the FCA when the holiday season is over, as I say, because the Chancellor wants a long-term asset fund up and running by November. Whether he gets that or not remains to be seen. Um, and finally, just worth uh, mentioning a few things going on um, at the Treasury. Um, there will be an NSNI green bond launched this year, £15 billion pounds worth um, going onto the market. So this is going to be a three-year cash savings product, like a three-year bond provided by NSNI, uh, which the government is then going to invest in, in, green, in its green, green projects. Um, bit of a sticky one for the Treasury, I think, here, because whatever they do here they're going to rub someone up, up the wrong way because if you look at the kind of the best buy of the three-year bond which this will compete with it's about 1.3 percent so if it wants to be a reasonable product with a reasonable interest rate it's going to be somewhere there or thereabouts but actually the government can borrow money for three years at about 0.2 percent which you could then if it wanted to invest in its green projects it's choosing to fund um, its, its green projects via, via this route which is good because it gives savers a, a green a green option uh, which is backed by nsni but how do they square that circle of on the one hand uh, if you're offering a high rate to, to savers then you're disadvantaging the taxpayer and on the other hand if you're offering kind of a market rate based on gilts then i don't think you're going to get too many takers at 0.2 percent when they people can get a, um, a three-year bond at 1.3 percent um so um some some difficult questions for the treasury to to ask there i mean we've seen them simply bump the rate up as we did with george osborne's pensioner bonds which landed just before an election of course uh whereby you know higher rates were given to um uh, uh to 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 investors in those his products through nsni compared to what government borrowing was and that was very costly for the government um but we're obviously in the period when there's a huge amount of scrutiny on balancing the books because of the coronavirus spend 
We've also got questions about the, the, the state um, pension triple lock, um, because as we saw earlier, earnings are running very hot right now. Um, now, historically, the um, state pension triple lock, which, um, by the way, kind of um, requires state pension to be uprated by the highest of 2.5% inflation or earnings, that is based on, on July figures historically. Um, and so it looks like, um, you know, the um, uh, earnings could be the winner there with kind of earnings around 7 or 8%, which would give, a, you know, a big boost to pensioners, 7 or 8%. Um, the Conservatives have said in their, in their man, election manifesto they will maintain the triple log, but obviously giving pensioners a kind of 7% boost to their, uh, to their income when a lot of younger people have lost their jobs throughout the pandemic, struggling to get onto the housing market, etc. There's obviously a big political question about how, how palatable that is, so that's something that's probably going to rumble on. And finally, um, uh, pensions tax relief. Uh, under threat. There were stories in the press around a month ago um, um, saying that uh, the Treasury were looking at um, a, a pensions tax relief. Now, I am going to forgive those of you who are currently rolling your eyes at me because I am usually doing the same thing when I hear about pensions tax relief being under threat, but I have actually heard from a very good authority uh, that this is something the Treasury was looking at um, and continues to look at. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that it is um, going to, to make it into policy. I suspect that you know policymakers will bump up against the same issues that they have previously on pensions tax relief in terms of it being very politically um, toxic to raid people's pensions and also the fact that lots of you know work schemes of course simply take um, your pension contributions from your pre-tax income so you'd have to dig up lots of the plumbing of the pension system. But just to say this time there was fire as well as smoke um, so, um, you know, I'm sure it won't be the last warning that you hear the pensions tax relief is under threat. So um, I think that brings it to a close uh, for today. So here's, um, you know, just some notes for you to read. So just remains for me to say thank you very much uh, for listening this morning and I hope you have a good day.